So when we focus on the joint, well, what's actually going on in there? Well, there are a lot of different types of tissues even within the joint. So here's a listing of several of them. You've got the synovial lining. You've got the articular capsule, the bursa lining. And actually, the, the, you know, what the heck is a bursa, right? So a bursa is kind of like a water balloon. It is a fluid-filled sac that acts as a kind of a cushioning between t mostly tendons and uh, the attachment on the bone. And so it works to reduce the friction of movement as those tendons and muscles are moving around. But unfortunately, that, that bursa can a lot of times get irritated, inflamed, and painful uh, if the forces acting on that joint and that bursa are not, you know, not uh, normal. The meniscus, uh, a lot of folks have heard about the meniscus in the knee. You hear about meniscal tears and so on. Uh, the labrum, this is a structure that uh, has received a lot of attention over the last 15 or 20 years. It's basically a fibrous cup that uh, primarily is found in the hip joint as well as the shoulder joint. So you hear, for example, about uh, baseball pitchers or swimmers that have a labral tear in their shoulder. Or you hear about these athletes that have, uh, you know, runners, for example, a labral tear in their hip. So this labrum is this fibrous cup that a lot of times that's inside the joint that many times can cause pain. Then you've got the discs. So not only do you have discs in your spine, but you actually have a disc in the TMJ joint in your jaw. And so that disc structure is actually not too different from the discs that you have in your spine. Of course, it's much, much smaller. You also have a disc in your wrist. It's known as the triangular fibrocartilage complex. And it's this complex of like a little disc-like structure with some ligaments and stuff like that in your wrist. And so uh, some, for some individuals that have a, a traumatic injury to the wrist, like a fall on an outstretched hand, you can get a tearing of that disc, of that uh, TFCC for short, that triangular uh, fibrocartilage complex in the wrist. Uh, and uh, you can have, of course, issues with the cartilage. So osteoarthritis classically affects the cartilage. Osteoarthritis is a little bit of a misnomer because it sounds like it has something to do with bone. You hear all the time about doctors ordering these x-rays, and you can say, ah, oh, you see this x-ray? You see how the bone there is kind of messed up? Well, you have arthritis in that joint. But by definition, uh, arthritis is not a disorder of the bone, it's actually a disorder of the cartilage. And what happens in advanced arthritis is that the cartilage wears away so badly that it affects the bone. And then so you hear people talk about this bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, and that's what you can see on the x-ray, because the x-ray does not show cartilage. Cartilage is actually invisible on an x-ray, uh, but you can see bone. And so when the arthritis is significant enough that it's affecting the bone, that's what you see on the x-ray. But what's interesting is that cartilage itself doesn't really have any pain fibers in it. In fact, when you look at the research studies, it floats somewhere between 15, only 15 to 20 percent of people that have osteoarthritis actually are symptomatic in terms of having pain and range of motion problems, that kind of thing. So the other 80 to 85 percent of people with arthritis in a particular joint don't have any symptoms. So uh, what that tells us is that, yes, arthritis is a big problem, but it doesn't necessarily automatically mean that you're going to have pain and dysfunction if you happen to have arthritis in your joint. In fact, you know, if you take the general population, a high percentage of people uh, past a certain age are going to have knee arthritis, but most folks are walking around and they're you know, doing just fine. Uh, so that's something to think about. You know, just because you have arthritis doesn't mean it's a problem. And just because you don't have arthritis doesn't mean that you don't have a good reason for pain in your joint. There are plenty of other structures besides the cartilage that can cause pain, as we can see from this list right here. Okay, so the exact mechanisms of joint pain are quite complicated for a, a, a large reason because you have so many different tissues that are inside that joint. So we're not going to go into a whole lot of detail here, but just know that it is quite multifactorial. So you've got issues with mechanical influences on joint pain. This is a very nice example of a mechanical cause of joint pain there, a little ugly. Uh, genetic, genetic influences, big factor. Osteoarthritis, a huge, uh, a huge cause of that is really genetic. Yeah. Uh, and they've done these very sophisticated twin studies where they had, uh, this is a uh, European study, where they studied 400, actually over 400 sets of identical twins. And they looked, they teased out the differences in lifestyle. And they found that the greatest of, uh, impact on arthritis and disc degeneration in the spine was genetics. So all this stuff about you know, being a marathon runner or doing weightlifting or being a truck driver, all of those things actually did not have that significant an impact on the development of those conditions. Genetics, however, big influence. Uh, Age-related, of course, you know, unfortunately, the more wise we become or the more senior we become, the more chance there is of that degeneration occurring over time. Nutritional and dietary influences. The issues of inflammation and having a diet that promotes 
infl the, the maintenance of this chronic low-level inflammatory problem. Uh, a lot of people talk about the so-called Mediterranean diet being low in inflammatory mediators, and that can help a lot of people who have significant problems with infl inflammatory arthritic pain. Uh, and then you've got this kind of nebulous, infectious, or autoimmune stuff that's going on. And this is an area where there's a lot of active research going on. Uh, there are some theories looking at viral activation of certain arthritic and joint problems, uh, and also the fact that you have your whole host of autoimmune problems, the rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, lupus, and so on. Those are all conditions where there's an autoimmune effect where, unfortunately, your own immune system attacks your own uh, joint lining or cartilage and that kind of thing. All right, so one thing to keep in mind is that when you have someone who has a joint problem and you're doing a comprehensive evaluation of that area from a structural perspective, you can't just isolate the joint. You have to look at the whole area. And so when you're looking at the whole area in all of its anatomical complexity, yes, you have the joint, and within that joint you have all those different tissues like the synovium and the cartilage and the labrum and all that kind of stuff. But then you've got all this stuff outside of the joint, the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles, the connective tissue, all of those things, the nerves. And so y it's very difficult to segregate what's going on inside the joint from what's going on around the joint. And so to really comprehensively evaluate that, you have to look at the whole picture. You have to look at all of that stuff. This concept is uh, referred to sometimes as tensegrity. Tensegrity is uh, a combination of the words tension and integrity. What that means is that the human body, actually not just the human body, many examples of life on Earth really, are good examples of where the integrity of a structure is based not on its ability to withstand compression, but more its ability to distribute forces through tension. Look at, for example, a giraffe's neck. Okay, a giraffe's neck is a very good example. How long is that sucker? Well, you know, if that giraffe's neck had to rely solely on bony support, it would collapse uh, very easily. Instead, it relies on the support of ligaments and tendons, which are stretching and they're under tension. And it's that tension effect that allows that neck to maintain its integrity through a whole range of motion. Uh, cranes operate uh, on a similar uh, concept in terms of having tension that maintains its integrity. Human body is the same thing. It's not so much the bones that are supporting all of the forces going through the body, it's really the ligaments and tendons that are modulating these forces as we go through our, the activity of our daily lives. So because ligaments and tendons are so important in terms of the overall integrity of a joint structure, I'm going to spend some time and talk about this because this, this area is significantly ignored, unfortunately, in conventional uh, musculoskeletal medicine. The most that people do is that, oh, let's say you get a sprain in your ankle, okay, here's some anti-inflammatories, maybe ice it, here's a brace, do some physical therapy, and there you go. And if you're not better, oh, well, what are you going to do about it? Not a whole lot. Maybe throw some steroid injections in there. But what's interesting is that I'm going to show you some information that indicates that both anti-inflammatories and steroids are actually, they can have a negative effect on one's healing potential. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. So, oh, you know, one interesting uh, um, piece of information that I learned uh, just a few weeks ago at a recent conference. So ankle sprains, very, very common. One of the most common ligamentous injuries in the human body is this uh, anterior talofibular ligament in your ankle. Ligamentous sprains happen all the time, so the human body should be able to adapt and heal, right? Well, how ma what percentage of ligamentous injuries in the ankle become chronic in the U.S.? 40%. So almost half of anyone that sprains their ankle during their lifetime, it's going to become a chronic issue. Well, why is that? We don't know exactly, but I can tell you, you know, what's some of the first stuff that a doctor will tell you to do? Ah, uh, go take some anti-inflammatories. Put ice on it, right? Well, the thing about, and I'm going to go into a little bit of detail here in a moment, but Inflammation is the first stage of healing, and it's a critical stage in healing, and if you block inflammation with anti-inflammatories, guess what? You really blunt your healing response, and you're not going to heal as well as you could. So how common are ligament and tendon injuries? About 30 to 50 percent, it's estimated, of all musculoskeletal injuries are ligament and tendon injuries, and there are over 100 million of these musculoskeletal injuries worldwide per year. So that's many millions of injuries to the tendons and ligaments. So, okay, let's take a closer look at these, uh, at these structures. So a tendon is a structure that attaches muscle to bone. 
you talk about sprains and strains, right? So a strain is a stretch injury to a tendon, whereas a sprain is the identical type of stretch injury to a ligament, right? And I'll talk about that in a second. Everybody hears about tendonitis, knee tendonitis, shoulder tendonitis. Well, by definition, tendonitis means inflammation of the tendon. But what's interesting is if an injury is more than three to four weeks old, it is no longer inflammatory. If you look at these things under a microscope after three to four weeks, there are no signs whatsoever of the classic inflammatory changes that define inflammation. You know, inflammation is defined by certain types of cells in the area and all that kind of stuff. So what's a more appropriate term is tendinosis. So tendinosis is this chronic degenerative process. And we've known about this since 1976. But how many doctors out there talk about a chronic tendon problem not being inflammatory? Not a whole lot. So if you throw anti-inflammatories at a chronic tendon problem, is that really going to help? It might help a little bit with the pain, but it's not inflammatory. So it's not really going to be you know, changing what's going on there. Um, a common term that's being used nowadays is tendinopathy. So tendinopathy is really any painful disorder of the tendon. So if you don't have a, a microscope image of tendinosis, which is right here, you can see normal tendon, nice parallel lines, fibular pattern like this. In tendinosis, it's all kind of mucky in there with random cells all over the place, and it's just kind of disorganized tissue. All right. Examples of tendinopathy and tendinosis as seen on ultrasound demonstrated here. So this is a sideway, uh, kind of like a, a horizontal image of the Achilles tendon. So that's normal tendon right there. This shows a small focal area of tendinopathy. I don't know if you can appreciate that. It's a little darker zone right there underneath those two arrows. This is a more significant example of tendinopathy where one, you have the darkened area, but two, you see how the tendon is thickened there? It's almost twice as thick as the image over here. This is very common in terms of tendinopathy. What happens is that the, the tissues have that disorganized look like this, right? So because it's disorganized tissue and it's no longer tightly packed parallel lines, the, 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 the fibers just, they get thicker. You know, so it's a thicker fiber it is a weaker fiber uh, because you've lost some of that integrity, and that's why you get this thickening on the ultrasound. So this is a classic appearance of tendinopathy. Uh, this just shows an MRI correlation of uh, that Achilles tendinopathy right there. This is what you see on an MRI uh, when it's flipped uh, vertically there, all right? All right, so now ligaments. So ligaments are structures that attach bone to bone. So tendon attaches a muscle to a bone, ligament attaches bone to bone. But when you look at these things under a microscope, they actually look pretty similar in terms of the, the structure of the fibers and that kind of thing. As I mentioned before, a sprain is specifically an injury to a ligament, whereas a strain is an injury to a tendon or a muscle. I want to discuss this thing called the enthesis. All right, what the heck is that? All right, so the enthesis is a structure, this is receiving a lot more attention recently in musculoskeletal medicine. By definition, it is the attachment site of all these structures to the bone. Tendons, ligaments, the synovium, the joint capsule, the bursa, where all these things attach to the bone, that's the enthesis. Why is it so important? It is, generally speaking, the site of maximum stress. Like if you have a stress injury uh, to a particular body area, that stress gets focused at the attachment site which is the enthesis. So this has become a very, uh, in, an increasingly uh, recognized structure in terms of the importance of where the injury actually occurs. This is a microscopic view of that enthesis. So you kind of have your ligament that's over here, and then it comes in and then you start getting this, these fibrocartilage cell thingies here, and then it becomes, it turns into this fibrocartilage, then you have this tide mark line, and then it transitions into bone. So you kind of have this transitional zone where it goes from sort of like ligament to cartilage to bone, okay? And an enthesopathy, just like tendinopathy, is a general term for a painful condition of that enthesis. This enthesis becomes very important when it comes to the practical application of these regenerative injection therapies because you do the injections at the, at the enthesis because you're healing the area where the injury occurs and it also maximizes your safety, and I'll talk about that a little bit later.